You're now listening to the Fantasy Filler Podcast. Where we put you in the driver's seat every week, all year long. In the NASCAR racing world, from top news stories, latest results, and best fantasy lineups, we'll have you up to speed and out in front before the drop of the green flag. So let's dive in with our host, Vanilla Wafers. We just got done with a nostalgic weekend at North Wilkesboro Speedway. It's been since 1996 since we have raced at this iconic short track. It was left abandoned for 27 years. But thanks to a few people as well as some extra money, we were able to get some races back here at this short track for a Truck Series point race and the non-expedition race and NASCAR All-Star event. We're going to be talking about the final results for both races plus the future for North Wilkesboro. All that and more on today's episode of the Fantasy Filler Podcast. I really hope you guys had an opportunity to watch at least one race this weekend because no matter if the racing was good or not, it's still such an amazing feeling that we were able to bring this track back from the dead. People thought that we would never, ever, ever return to North Wilkesboro Speedway. People were just begging just to see the inside of it and they wouldn't allow it. But Thanks to some events that happened and a little bit of extra money and, of course, a lot of support from a lot of people online, including Dale Earnhardt Jr. and Slap Shoes, a popular YouTuber in the NASCAR racing world. We were able to bring this track back. And I got to tell you, the people in the North Wilkesboro County area wanted this track back. Just look at the seats throughout the week. A lot of people were kind of complaining about the prices of the tickets, which I understand. You can only get one ticket for the entire week. You couldn't pick one specific day. And I think it was around $500. There was a lot of money. But fans came in droves. There wasn't an empty seat at that event. And you just got to be so excited to see that. I mean, the Truck Series race, that's the most fans we have seen in a very, very long time for a Truck Series event. And, and th- that's so cool to see. And the racing was a lot of fun to see that old surface. They didn't hardly do anything to that surface except for some sealant on the racetrack where there was a lot of cracks and weeds trying to grow through. And they completely redid the pit road. But mostly it looked like that pavement has been waiting for us to return. And, and that is just such a cool feeling. It just looked like the place stayed frozen in time except for a few modifications. But it worked out really, really well. So at the very least, I think this is going to be one of the most memorable weekends that NASCAR has had in a very, very long time. I think this is going to be more memorable than the dirt race at Bristol. It's going to be more memorable than some of the road course races that we just added onto the schedule. It's definitely going to be on a lot of people's minds. But was it all a good event? Did the All-Star race absolutely deliver to the point that everyone was super excited, just glued to the TV? Or was it a little lackluster? What about the Truck Series event? Was that one at least entertaining? Or did we have the Cup Series drivers absolutely stink up the show? Well, we're going to talk about that, some of the biggest takeaways, and also the future of the track in today's episode. Let's first start off with the first race here of this weekend. We're not going to be talking about the late model tours. We're just going to focus on NASCAR's top three divisions. So let's focus on the Saturday race for the Truck Series event. Without further ado, here's the final results for... The Tyson 250. Alrighty, so here in this truck race, we had a total of 40 trucks on the entry list. Unfortunately, one of those trucks was not able to qualify for the event at all, and that was the number 46 truck of Akinori Ogata. I hope I said his name right. I do apologize. I feel like I've said it differently every single time. He unfortunately got into a very scary accident during practice session where the truck just caught on fire. Thank goodness he was okay, but there was no way in hell that that truck could be able to qualify. So they packed it up and called it a day. The other three who were not able to qualify for the event was the number 75 of Parker Kligerman, the number 33 of Josh Rayom, and the number 6 of Norm Benning. All drivers that I know a lot of people were hoping made it into the main event, but unfortunately, it was a really competitive qualifying group. There was a lot of tough drivers who were trying to make it in, and unfortunately, there were some good drivers who had to miss the show, so that sometimes happens 
here in the Truck Series. Here's some of the Xfinity Series and Cup Series drivers that participated in the event. Uh, we had Kyle Larson in the number 7 machine for Spire Motorsports. Bubba Wallace drove the number 1 truck for Tricon Garage. Then we had Ross Chastain with Nice Motorsports in the 41. William Byron drove the number 51 for Kyle Busch Motorsports. Christopher Bell for Hattori Racing in the number 61 truck. And then we had Josh Williams. I almost said Rayom. I do apologize for that. He was driving for AM Racing in that number 22 truck. In the end... In the end, after running 252 laps, we did go into overtime, have 12 cautions for 81 laps, and six lead changes amongst five different drivers. The driver to win was the one who led the most laps, 138 laps to be exact. It was the 2021 champion of Kyle Larson, pulling off the victory with Spire Motorsports in the number seven truck. He is your winner here for the first race back at North Wilkesboro Speedway. It was a phenomenal run for him. I mean, leading 138 laps. Yes, there were some cautions there near the end that a lot of people got a little bit concerned, like, oh man, maybe someone will be able to edge him out. He had the most dominant truck. There was no one that was going to be able to pass him unless they raced him overly aggressive and kind of dirty, which thank goodness nobody really did that, and we can all really appreciate that. But Kyle Larson was not supposed to run this race. It was supposed to be, I believe, Alex Bowman. I don't think Kyle Larson had a planned race at all down here in the truck series, but he had to come in and substitute. And what a great race for him to substitute because he was able to grab the victory. And Spire Motorsports absolutely needed this. They've missed a few big races due to some unlucky incidents. So for them to get a victory, you know that they are super happy about that. So kudos to them. But man, Kyle Larson has raced at 199 different tracks. It doesn't matter what type of track it is. There is a chance that he's going to wind up in victory lane, and he was able to win this truck race in dominating fashion. In the second and third spot were truck series regulars. We have the number 98 of Ty Majeski, as well as the number 25 of Matt Benedetto. Matt Benedetto's team in that number 25 truck is really starting to improve as the weeks go by. I don't think they're going to be looked at as a team that could potentially just win super speedway races. If they keep this momentum up, they're going to be contenders for a lot of other races. Mostly, the I'd say the shorter intermediate tracks and the short tracks, but that's exactly what this team needs. They need to keep that momentum going at these types of tracks because these will be the tracks that will not only get them into the playoffs, but very far into the playoffs, potentially for a championship run. Now, that's pretty far-fetched. I do understand that. I mean, the team has only gotten one win in their entire existence, but still, Great improvements. I mean, really good improvements from what we saw at the beginning of the year. That's absolutely great. Ty Majeski in that number 98 truck. He's just been a great driver all around in that machine. I'm not going to be surprised if we see him in the final four once again. Just a really good performance for him here in this race. And if there was any truck series regulars that was going to be able to knock off Kyle Larson, it was going to be him. Finishing fourth in this race, we have the number 42 of Carson Hosefar. Scored a lot of stage points. Looked really good throughout this entire race. He needs more consistency, and he definitely got in this event. Looked really strong at a few points. I don't know if he was ever the truck to beat, but he definitely hung around the top five the entire event. And the team has to feel really happy about that. Especially, you know, now you got your driver. He's locked in. He's got that victory. And now he just needs to show some consistency. Now he needs to get, just get his feet under, get prepared for the playoffs. He showed really good results throughout the entire weekend here at North Wilkesboro. And the team's got to be very appreciative of that. So good performance by Carson Hosevar. A little aggressive throughout the race. But here at this short track kind of feel, we can allow that. He wasn't straight dumping people. So... And I feel like that's a little bit more of an improvement than what we've seen in past races. So good for Carson Hosefar for him to get that top five. Bubba Wallace in the number one machine. He did a really, really great job. At one point, it looked like he could potentially uh, steal the race because he was the one who stayed out on older tires. And it worked out really well for him. I was very impressed to see what Bubba Wallace was able to do. I mean, so a lot of people forget the fact that he was one of the top competitors during his time in the Craftsman Truck Series. He did a really good job, got multiple victories. And here with a truck that's probably not at the same level as some of these other trucks, I like Tricon Garage, but they, they, they seem to be one level below some of the top teams down here. They're right there, but just slightly off, and he was running on older tires, just put on a great run, did everything he could to hold everyone off. Unfortunately, he was just not going to be able to do it. The track really ate up tires, but hey, he was able to do at least one crossover with Kyle Larson, got a lot of people up on their feet. It was very cool to see these Cup Series drivers duke it out, and then potentially Maybe a truck series driver trying to sneak by the both of them. Did not happen, but hey, 
at least Bubba Wallace put on a great show and able to finish with a top five. His partner, Corey Heim, had himself probably the second best race out of everybody as he was able to win the first stage and lead 75 laps. And just there near the end, was just not able to keep up with Kyle Larson, Ty Majeski, and those guys. Just did not work in his favor. The restarts definitely didn't work in his favor. So for him to finish six, I know is a bit of a bummer, but... Hey, he's still a strong competitor. It still shows that Corey Heim is going to be one of the most competitive drivers here running for this championship. They just got to be able to execute from beginning to end. And unfortunately for this one, didn't execute it as well as they could have. Here's the rest of the top 10. We have the number 88 of Matt Crafton. Good run for him. Chase Purdy also had a good run. He really needed a good finish here in that number 4 for Kyle Busch Motorsports. He finishes 8th. Ross Chastain, the number 41. He finishes ninth. And rounding up the top 10 was the number 23 of Grant Infinger for GMS Racing. Here's some noticeable drivers who finished outside the top 10 that we really should mention here. Uh, first one being William Byron. He was another person on pit strategies. He had himself a very good truck, but it did not work in his favor. Everyone else, they, they kind of took some gambles here and there, and it sometimes paid off, sometimes it didn't. Him at the very end, it just did not work out. 11th place finish, and for him to finish 2nd and 5th in both the stages and lead 10 laps, that's a heartbreaker. That's a bad way to end, but it is what it is. William Byron just kind of struggled this weekend here at North Wilkesboro, so he's definitely going to try his best to forget this weekend. We also had Stuart Friesen and Christopher Bell. They were able to get stage points at the beginning, but they slowly fell off. They were another group of drivers who were just not able to really work out with the pit strategies in their favor. So Stuart Friesen finishes 13th, and Christopher Bell in that number 61 truck finishes 16th. So I know Christopher Bell definitely wanted a way better finish than that, but it is what it is. Hattori Racing, unfortunately, things to just, uh, just did not pay out well for them. I mean, you had Christopher Bell in the third spot in stage one. You had Tyler Ang Ankrum running around the top 10 throughout the entire race. And then Tyler Ankrum gets caught up in an incident that involves him and Christian Eckes as well as some other drivers. And he unfortunately finishes 26th. Christian Eckes was another driver I mentioned there. Got caught up in an accident and finished 25th. That, that's just the situation with short track racing. If you're there near the back, uh, you do definitely do not want to be back there because you're going to get caught up in an incident. And the driver who got the worst end out of all of that when it came to being in the back, getting into short track problems, was the number 38 of Zane Smith. Zane Smith had himself a great truck. He finished 7th in Stage 1, 3rd in Stage 2, and then he finished 32nd overall. What happened was there was a big old bottleneck on one of the restarts. He got the worst end of it, got the worst damage. I, I Well, Raha Karuth and Ben Rhodes also got a lot of damage in that incident. But it hit him, it was the biggest bummer because he had himself a really, really great truck. And then he got himself a speeding penalty. It just proves once again that this season, speeding penalties are some of the worst penalties you can get right now because you're just going to get caught up in an incident. It's happened in the truck series. It's happened in the cup series. It, it's just been a devastating uh, situation that happens to drivers I think worse than ever I don't ever remember them having this many bad luck incidents immediately after getting caught in a speeding penalty or just having a pit road in issue in general now it happens to Zane Smith he finishes 32nd in this race Ben Rhodes finished 33rd and then Raha Karuth the rookie finishes 24th now, before we talk about the racing, let's also give some shout-outs to some smaller teams here that definitely deserve a mention. Chris Hacker in the number 30 truck was able to finish 12th. Great run for those guys, and Chris Hacker's a part-time driver. He's been doing really good when he gets his moments. I, I Actually, the 30 truck has been getting some decent finishes, and you got to give him credit for that. I mean, you had Ryan Vargas able to finish inside the top 15. Now you get Chris Hacker. I, I mean, th just having these part-time drivers come in and get these solid finishes, that's not bad for a small team like them. So kudos for them to get the 12th place finish. Brett Holmes, he was having a rough start to the beginning of the race. He was able to finish it out in the 15th position. And then Caden Honeycutt. In the number 20 truck with, again, another solid run. This time, though, he only finished at 17th, but at some points he was running around the 11th position. you got to give a shout-out for someone like that running in small equipment. Overall, these three definitely deserve some highlights in this race, as those were some of the smaller teams that had themselves good finishes near the end. Now, let's talk about the racing in this race in general. That's a kind of a funny sentence to say. Racing and race in general. <laughs> so, this had all the feeling of a short track race. And well, it kind of almost reminds me of Bristol a few years back. You know, Bristol was only a one-line groove. And they'd be doing bumps and runs. They'd be banging into each other, just trying to get past each other. Wouldn't be to the point where if you bumped into someone, the vehicle was destroyed. That didn't happen. And the same feeling 
happened here at North Wilkesboro. These guys were bumping and banging and sliding, and it was so entertaining. I absolutely loved it. It was a lot of fun. It wasn't really kind of dirty racing. It was overall just, there's no other way to say it, short track racing. And it feels like it's been something that's been missing for quite a bit here in NASCAR. I know for the Cup Series, they were kind of having that with the Gen 6 car. But unfortunately, the Gen 7 car has come in and they've been having shifting issues at those short tracks. And what I mean by that is drivers are able to shift down. So if they overdrive the corner, just shift down and you'll be able to recover no problem. That's really affected these racetracks uh, very negatively. But that hasn't been the case here for the Truck Series. They put on one hell of a show here. And even though Kyle Larson dominated the race, we still did not know who was going to be the winner. It really, if you think about it, anything could have happened there near the end. You could have had someone try to do the bump and run, and it could have ended Kyle Larson's day. Who knows? Thank goodness that did not happen. But it kept everyone at the edge of their seat, and that is absolutely something you want here in these lower series. You want fans to be excited for these types of races, especially ones where you know a lot of people are tuning in. There could be a very good chance that the Craftsman Truck Series now gets a few extra viewers for the next few weeks just by the good showing that they had here in this race. And I really do believe that. I, I'm not going to say to the point where it's going to double viewership or be passing the x series or making it close to the Cup Series. No, no, no. They don't need to do that. They just need to see an improvement. And I think that they definitely deserve that here this weekend. And if at the very least we do not get a Cup Series points race or they decide not to return back for the Cup Series at all at North Wilkesboro, which I find it very unlikely that would happen, at the very least, please get the Truck Series here. Keep them at this racetrack because they put on an amazing show that I know the fans love. And if you're going to include the smaller series of the Truck Series, then throw ARCA in here. Throw maybe even the Xfinity Series. You need more than just one division here showing up to this racetrack. But all in all, just keep the Truck Series here. It was a very fun race. I give it a solid 9 out of 10. It was definitely the best race of the weekend for me. Definitely watch the replays. Memorability, obviously it's going to be a 10 because of the return. Uh, competitiveness, I'd say more of an 8. Kyle Larson was definitely the stronger driver. But everything else, 9s and 10s. Definitely one of the best races for the Truck Series so far here this year. Now let's move on to the biggest event of the weekend, and that was the Cup Series All-Star Race. Now we're going to talk about the heat races as well as the Open, but we're not really going to dive in too much to that. We're mostly going to focus on the uh, Cup Series race, so a little bit of multiple races will be talked about here in this next segment. But without further ado, it is time to dive into the All-Star Event for the NASCAR Cup Series. <laughs> Now, I already know what some people are thinking. Oh, man, if the Truck Series ran that well, then definitely the Cup Series should have been just as good, if not better. Well, I would like to think that, <laughs> but unfortunately, well, you're just going to have to listen. May, may you be the judge on this one. But we had 37 cars on the entry list, only one open charter car, and that was Chandler Smith in a number 13. 21 drivers were already locked into the main show. Three more would have to qualify in. Two of them would be from the open, and one would be from the fan vote. We did have a few heat races as well as the pit crew challenge, which was a lot of fun to watch that pit crew challenge. I think... Anytime NASCAR does anything involving the pit crews, I think fans really do enjoy that. And and I think NASCAR's starting to figure that out. So hopefully they keep this going in the future because I like pit crew challenges. I like when they get the whole team involved. It, it is really, really fun. And sometimes I wish they did it at more events. Unfortunately, we don't have that many non-expedition events. But a person could dream. You know what I mean? But <laughs> we had the heat races. And this was mostly just for the drivers who were already in the main show. And so we had two heat races. One had 10 cars and the other had 11 cars. And there was something very interesting that happened here in the first heat race. NASCAR for the first time ran the oval rain tires. Now this could have went one or two ways. Let's be honest here. It was either going to end well and everyone at NASCAR would be patting themselves on the back and saying, see, we should have ran this a long time ago. Or it would have been something similar to Coda, but an absolute nightmare and everyone would hate NASCAR even more. I don't think there would have been an in-between. Luckily, it was the first scenario. The racing was decent. I wouldn't say it was super exciting, but it did absolutely what it needed to do. It was able to get these heat races going with no problems. We only had 
one caution and it was due to the track condition they had to actually change the tires and honestly it was pretty cool to see that and now we know that nascar will be prepared for these types of situations for the short tracks remember it's not every single short track it will be only for the road courses and certain events i think the ones that were left out were ones like bristol and dover i think were the two that were left out other tracks that are about um, 1.3 miles or shorter should be still on that list but the racing was fun. Daniel Suarez, out of all people, was able to win the first heat race. I did not expect him to be a front runner, but then again, when it comes to new racetracks, he's also another driver that tends to do really good. Joe Logano right behind him finished in second. Chase Briscoe finished third. Christopher Bell finished fourth, and then Denny Hamlin wrapped out the top five. Now, there was only two people who led laps, Daniel Suarez and Chase Elliott. Chase Elliott led before the track condition started to change, but Daniel Suarez was still able to make that pass before that caution happened. After that, it was just Daniel Suarez riding off into the sunset. I really feel like drivers were just trying to get a feel for the car at that point. It was definitely the first time they ever ran on these types of tires, and most drivers said that they actually got more gripped out of the rain tires than they did the regular slick tires, and that's kind of humorous, but at the same time, was a little concerning because maybe a lot of people thought, oh, they could potentially switch those tires. Thank goodness NASCAR made a rule that they did not do that. I don't think we need that type of situation, especially that we're in the testing grounds for this brand new tire. Maybe in the future, but definitely not right now. But it definitely put on a decent showing. It wasn't anything that of concern. So, hey, good news all around for them. Now, the only bad thing about this is the simple fact that these drivers were not going to be able to learn anything from their heat race because they weren't going to be running the same tires. So that's a downer. It is what it is. When you have weather problems, you have weather problems. There's not much else you can do. And I think a lot of fans and drivers would all agree that they would rather have a race on rain tires rather than delaying the vent. So still, it was good all around. The next heat race, they were able to run on the slicks, and it was the Chris Buescher show. Chris Buescher led every single lap in that race. Second spot was Austin Dillon. Third was William Byron. Fourth was Brad Keselowski, and rounding out the top five was the number 23 of Bubba Wallace. Now, this was all right. I, I don't think many people had concerns about this, except for the fact that you only had one person lead every single lap. And it felt more like these drivers were not really being as competitive as we wish they were. Ross Chastain and Kyle Larson lost a ton of positions, and Brad Keselowski was able to gain a lot of positions. But other than that, nobody really made any advances or declines. You had Austin Dillon start second, finish second. You had William Byron start third, finish third. Martin Trex Jr. start sixth, finish sixth. And then Tyler Reddick start tenth, and then finish tenth. So people got very concerned about this, and and rightfully so. You're just like, uh oh, they're not doing that much passing, and they already know how important it is to start near the front, and they weren't doing it. So what's going on? Well, we we started to learn real quickly that this track was going to be extremely hard to pass on unless you were going to ram into the other person, and, and I don't think people were willing to do that that early into the weekend. It was only heat races, but at the same time, it, it proved to a lot of people, hey, that's what you're going to have to do to make passes, and it was going to be very interesting to see who would do it and who would not. Then we went into the All-Star Open right before the main event, and I gotta tell you, this was the most exciting Cup Series race of the weekend. Uh, 16 drivers tried to make it in and for the final two spots, plus the fan vote. Of course, that wasn't going to be affected by this race unless they completely totaled their car. And there was a lot of action that happened here. A lot of passing, a lot of daring moves. We finally had a driver hit that inside wall. It was talked about throughout the entire week who was going to do that. And unfortunately for the number 42 team and Noah Gregson, they were the ones who hit that inside wall, flew up the track and took out multiple people, including a returning Ryan Newman, as well as Michael McDowell. Bummer for those guys. Michael McDowell definitely um, showed his anger towards the number 54, Ty Gibbs. Ty Gibbs, once again, pissing off drivers. He had himself a really good run but he was the most aggressive driver here in this race and I guess you could say good for him he was uh, willing to do what he could to run near the front but at the same time that could lead to some upset drivers and it cost him the win in the open to be honest with you because they lapped down Michael McDowell multiple times and Michael McDowell made it hell for him to make the pass to the point that Josh Berry was able to get around and Josh Berry was able to win the open 
Great to see the substitute driver jump in and just have the success he has been having. He had a second place finish at Richmond, so I'm not surprised that at another short track he was able to advance the 48 car into the main show. He's, he's just been doing a great job being a substitute driver. And it sounds like he is the main driver to be going into that number four car, which I think is absolutely awesome for him to be able to get that opportunity because he's clearly earned it. He's done himself a great job, and who knows what the future holds for him. People are hinting at the four car. Maybe it could be over with Legacy Motor Club. It could be Junior Motorsports if they were to move up into the Cup Series. Who knows? But still, either way, good run for Josh Berry. Ty Gibbs in the 54, he was still able to hold off Eric Amarola to hold on to the second position. And then you had Eric Amarola, Ryan Priest, and A.J. Allmendinger round out the top five. Unfortunately, those three drivers were not able to make it into the main show. If there was someone that should have made it in but unfortunately did not, it probably was the number 34 Michael McDowell had himself a great running car he was doing daring moves left and right he just looked really good throughout the entire event it just did not work in his favor like I said there was contact between him and Ty Gibbs never able to recover he gets caught up in that incident and it's just a bummer for that 34 team it seems like they always run into some problems at the open and Michael McDowell once again misses out on another all-star event absolute bummer for him and what's worse was he was not able to win the vote for the All-Star fan vote. That would go to the number 42 of Noah Gregson. Noah Gregson definitely has a lot of fans right now. And for him to be able to get that All-Star vote, I thought that was really cool. It's a bit of a bummer that his car was absolutely beat up at that point. Remember, he was the one who hit that inside wall. But hey, at least he finished on the lead lap and he was able to finish 7th. So kudos to them. But yeah, Noah Gregson's able to make it in on the fan vote. So those were the three drivers to move on into the main show. And then here in this All-Star race, 24 drivers running around this iconic racetrack who was going to be the victor in this race a lot of drivers had some good opportunities maybe it could have been daniel suarez or chris busher in the end though how about the driver who dominated the truck race yep kyle larson led 145 laps in the event he was able to pass daniel suarez in lap number 54 and except for lap 104 he led every single one of them all the way to the end he was the clear-cut winner and there was no one close to him there near the end Wins the million dollars and just puts on one hell of a performance in that number five car. I'll run through the top five here real quick and then just cover on some highlights and biggest takeaways here from this race. So in the second spot, we have the number 23 of Bubba Wallace, followed by the number 45 of Tyler Reddick. Good overall run for 23-11 as they were able to secure second and third. Unfortunately, those spots don't pay out. In the fourth spot was the number 14 of Chase Briscoe. And round out the top five was the number nine of Chase Elliott. So this race... I'm not going to lie. It was pretty lackluster. It really was. I, I hate to say that uh, after a race that everyone was so excited about. It was basically over in the first 18 laps. It really was. Kyle Larson started in the 24th position on that restart. The reason why he started in the 24th position was he took four tires and not many other drivers did. And then he went through the field past everyone and just rode off into the sunset. No one could ever pass him again. That's literally what happened here in this race. Now, it was cool that they decided to keep the pavement the same as it did back in 1996 when they left it, but with with old pavement comes worn out tires, and there's to the point where the track gets too worn out. Most people remember Atlanta Motor Speedway. Remember how bad that track was before they did the redesign? It would just eat up tires so bad to the point that no one could hardly pass. Yes, they were slipping and sliding, but there was no passing going on at all. That's what happened here in North Wilkesboro. And for these cars that already struggle as short tracks as it is, it was a bad combination. It really was. And the fact that Kyle Larson won the race on lap number 18 of the event, it just proves to you just how important tires were. And I don't mind tires being an important part of a race. I really don't. But when they are the only thing that matters... That's when I have a problem, and unfortunately, that was the situation here because Kyle Larson, he had himself a rough car for the Cup Series events. In the heat races in practice, he was showing no speed at all. Uh, obviously, when they went up front, it, things were looking really good, but it, if that tire change does not happen, I don't think he's running inside the top 10 at all in this race. Maybe sneaks in at the very end, but that's about it. That's how important tires were, and I just don't like that out of a race that should have been so exciting. It should have meant so much. And now we get back-to-back -back bad all-star races in a way. 
I, I think this one will be forgiven since it's at North Wilkesboro, but... Yeah, it's not looking good for the All-Star event when you have multiple bad uh, showings for a race that should be just one that should be exciting and fun. But when it's not exciting and fun, then you just get everyone that's super disappointed. Now, I don't want to make it sound all doom and gloom here for this All-Star event. There are still some moments that we should be proud of. Uh, first, with the dominating race, y yes, they're boring to watch at first, but this is going to be one of the most remembered races in a very, very long time. Mike Joy was just on Sirius XM NASCAR, and he made a really good point. What's one of the most talked about races in the late uh, 20, uh, 2010s? You could say maybe Kyle Busch and Kyle Larson's finish. Maybe you can say Kurt Busch and Kyle Busch at Kentucky. But one of the more talked about events is is the Colt Cole 600 where Martin Trex Jr. led 392 out of the 400 scheduled laps. People really admire those dominating performances, and this is probably the most dominating performance we've ever seen in an all-star event. Uh, maybe last year you could uh, you could make the argument that uh, Ryan Blaney was a more dominant person, but at the same time, there were some people who could have really ran against him there near the end or in the middle of the race. Kyle Larson, once he got that tire change, no one could keep up with him. So it was an old school ass whooping that we don't really see that much here in um, the newer part of NASCAR. So that's a positive thing. We can also be happy with the fact that the old Fox group was able to come back. They had Mike Joy, Larry McReynolds, and DW up there. And they looked like they were having an absolute blast. And Clint Boyer was joining in on them. And they, they all had a really good time. And that that's always important when you're watching an event. You want the announcers to have fun uh, while they're watching the race. And that's what we got. That's why we liked this group so much for so many years. They just made it just a little bit more entertaining. And I felt like they brought that little bit more of entertainment here in the this all-star race and I think everyone could be very appreciative of that and also when you look at the start and finishes it wasn't really a follow the leader there was definitely a lot of jockeying for positions when it was all said and done so I mean there's there's definitely some positives to take out of this race I don't think it's going to win any reward for intensity or competitiveness. Unfortunately, that's not going to be the case. But at least we know that this phrase track should be brought back for future events. Marcus, Marcus Smith for um, Speedway Motorsports Incorporated has not really given us a final answer on what the future holds for this racetrack, but I don't think they're giving up on it. I really don't think they're giving up on it, and they have some potential for this track in the future. I don't want to believe that this is going to be the best event that we have. There's no way that this is going to be the best event. This track has been able to put on great races in the past. They just got to make a few adjustments. They definitely got to change the surface of the track, whether it's a repave or it's a dirt track. If it becomes a dirt track, then it becomes its own event, and people can't really compare it to an older race like, man, I miss the old Bristol races. It's like, no, we're just going to be grateful that we see North Wilkesboro back on the map. But if they do repave it, then hey, maybe it's not going to be one of those races where it's follow the leader. Maybe it's multiple grooves and we get that side-by-side -side racing that some fans can enjoy when it comes to short track races. I know I really enjoy it because it, it, it sometimes puts on really good events. I, I don't need to see always bump and run short track racing. I like to see very competitive short track races where they can run side-by-side -side for five laps and you don't know who's going to get the advantage when it's all said and done. So I give this race probably a 6 out of 10. It's going to be one of the lower ranked ones, but it's definitely going to be one of those ones we have to remember and have to be grateful for that we even had this event to begin with. the final results and takeaways for today's episode guys thank you so much for listening next week we go back on the regular schedule as we will be going to a crown jewel event the longest race of the season the coca-cola 600 now last year it was hands down the best race of the season hopefully the same thing happens here this weekend i mean you got to be hyped up uh, if it's anything close to last year man we are in for a treat and of course the seven-time champion of jimmy johnson will be returning back to the track let's see how he can do in that number 84 car so we will have ourselves our fantasy pick episode on friday uh don't worry i'm not going to skip it we obviously didn't have it for this week just for the simple fact that there was no fantasy here this week and we just got to enjoy the race so we'll be back on normal schedule next episode will be either friday or at the very latest saturday super early 
in the morning. If you want to follow me on social media, you can do so on TikTok, YouTube, and Twitter. Just look up Vanilla Wafers and I will pop up every single time. Um, if you want to watch daily NASCAR videos, TikTok's usually the best spot. If you want to watch longer videos, more narrative, and maybe some goofier ones here in the future, check out YouTube at Vanilla Wafers. We're past 4,000 subscribers, heading towards 5,000 subscribers, so I'm super proud about that. And then Twitter, if you want to just talk to me, ask me questions, you can do so there. Multiple people have been asking me questions there, and I really do appreciate that, guys. So keep following me there, keep asking me questions, and just keep involved with me. I'll do my best to respond back to all of you. And also an announcement, I will be at Sonoma Raceway here in the coming weeks. I'm super excited for that event. I'm going to be hanging out with Live Fast Motorsports once again. They gave me another opportunity to come over there, but I'm going to make sure I see you guys around the racetrack. I know a few of you have asked me if I'm going to that event. Yes, I am. And I'm going to make sure you guys do not miss me. I'm going to be wearing my huge hat that you've been seeing in some of the TikTok videos. I just want to show that off and I want to see if I can get a few drivers to sign it because that's the main reason why I got it. I got it for NASCAR and NASCAR only and I really love that hat. So let's see how many signatures we can get there and see how many photos I can get with you guys with that stupid ass hat. I love it. <laughs> but let's wrap up the video there, guys. I have been your host, Vanilla Wafers, and I've been able to take you to the front of the field. So why don't we grab that checkered flag, do some burnouts, and head on out. So you all take care. This has been the Fantasy Filler Podcast. <laughs>